Good afternoon and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is David Bose and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Institute. And I am pleased to see so many of you here, uh, so many old friends and, and some people I don't recognize. So we're glad to have both of you here for the latest in our Distinguished Lecturer Series. Cato's Distinguished Lecturer Series began with F.A. Hayek and it has included James Buchanan, Mario Vargas Llosa, and Helen Suzman, the anti-apartheid crusader. Today's distinguished lecturer is eminently worthy of that company. I think of him as one of a great generation of pioneering libertarian thinkers. Mises, Hayek, Rand, Bauer, Friedman, Saz. He would probably hasten to point out that he is not of the same generation as Mises and Hayek, uh, but they were all alive and widely recognized as original thinkers when I first noticed things like that. I just take a note, a moment to note the value to America, I think, and certainly to the American libertarian movement of immigration because Mises, Hayek, Rand, Bauer, and Saz all came from Eastern and Central Europe to this country, and we've certainly benefited from all of their presence. I was amused a few years ago by a Wall Street Journal article, I still remember, front page story about critics of drug prohibition that said, quote, Legalizers span a broad philosophical range from liberal psychiatrist Thomas Saz to conservative economist Milton Friedman. <laughs> and I wondered then if you could come up with anything that Saz and Friedman disagreed about. Um, I guess the worry should be that, that, that's the psych that that's the broad philosophical range of people who favor legalization of drugs. Fortunately, I think it has expanded a bit since that article. Thomas Saz is a pioneering critic of the psychiatric establishment. He was born in Budapest in 1920 and came to this country in 1938, and it didn't take him very long to adjust. His publications list, which runs 36 pages on the Internet, uh, begins with articles in academic journals in 1947. And as most of you probably know, although English was not his native language, he is an extraordinarily precise and witty writer. He first achieved real prominence uh, with his book, The Myth of Mental Illness, the very title of which still drives his critics up the wall. His many books since then include Ceremonial Chemistry, The Ritual Persecution of Drugs, Addicts, and Pushers, Law, Liberty, and Psychiatry, Our Right to Drugs, The Ethics of Psychoanalysis, The Myth of Psychotherapy, and The Therapeutic State. In this lecture, he will draw on his most recent book, Liberation by Oppression, a Comparative Study of Slavery and Psychiatry, and his work in progress, Faith in Freedom, Libertarian Principles, and Psychiatric Practices. Somehow, like H.L. Mencken, along with all these books, he manages to write frequent articles as well for both academic journals and popular publications. Over the years, he has been published simply everywhere, from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal to the Lancet and the American Journal of Psychiatry to Playboy and Reason. These days, he writes a regular column for Ideas on Liberty, if you want to get a regular update of his thinking. Uh, Thomas Az is Professor of Psychiatry Emeritus at the State University of New York Health Science Center in Syracuse. He is a Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, a Life Member of the American Psychoanalytic Association, and an Adjunct Scholar of the Cato Institute. Two of his ad academic admirers, uh, Professors Richard Batts and Lee Weinberg, wrote in an introduction to his work, throughout his distinguished career, Thomas S. Saz has steadfastly defended the values of humanism and personal autonomy against all who would constrain human freedom with shackles formed out of conceptual confusion, error, and willful deception. Please welcome the Cato Institute's distinguished lecturer, Thomas Sass.
Thank you very much for this really lovely introduction, David. I appreciate it very much. And I want to thank you and the Cato Institute for inviting me to speak to you today. Is this okay? Okay. Well, this is a subject very dear to my heart, and I want to make it very, very clear what parameters I am talking within. Traditionally, historically, psychiatry was called mad doctoring. It's about the whole enterprise is only about 300 years old. And from its very beginning, and at its very beginning, it was a statist institution. Keep in mind that the mental hospitals used to be called state hospitals. The second aspect of psychiatry was it, that it used, it, to use libertarian language, it initiated violence in that it confined people who were not guilty of any crimes. It was in this respect the prototype of preventive detention. Uh, it was for the confinement of people who were considered, quote, dangerous to society. The language used now in mental health law is dangerous to themselves or others. Now, I want to distinguish this very sharply from what most people think today of psychiatry, uh, or perhaps still do, it's less so now than 30 years ago or 40 years ago, uh, that is they think of psychiatry as a part of medicine that helps people, exemplified by psychoanalysis. You go to a doctor and you pay him or to a psychologist, and you talk to him, and if uh, you don't like it, you leave. I'm not talking about this at all. I am talking about psychiatry, whose paradigmatic interventions are violence. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. What distinguishes surgeons from other doctors? That they cut into the body. If somebody didn't cut into the body, he would not be usually thought of as a surgeon. Now, what distinguishes a radiologist from other doctors? That he takes pictures, x-ray pictures, interprets them, and so on, besides whatever else he does. Now, what distinguishes psychiatrists from other doctors? One is that they detain people, they deprive people of liberty who have not committed any crimes, called civil commitment. The other one is the symmetrical operation, which virtually no one ever links to civil commitment, but I insist that it's the same thing, and that is the insanity defense. In the one case, innocent people are incarcerated. In the other case, guilty people are excused. Now, the fact that they, too, are generally locked up is a footnote to this. The point is they are excused. And Although this, again, is rarely associated, in my opinion, the insanity defense, which is at the heart of psychiatry, also going back three, four hundred years, is at the heart of the tobacco litigation, the fat litigation, this whole idea that individual actors, in Mises' sense, are not actors, but puppets. Someone else is responsible for their movements. We'll find out who that someone else is and we'll punish him. Now, how did this originate? I, in my uh, outline, which I sent to the Cato Institute to describe the lecture, I mentioned three things. Why is psychiatry a threat to freedom and, and responsibility? I just described that. How did this come into being? That is much more difficult to condense, but uh, let me remind you in this respect that the birth of psychiatry and the development of psychiatry, as probably most of you know already, is parallel to the decline of religion. And the, and the things which used to be controlled up to the 17th century, really up to the Enlightenment, the 17th century is a warish at mark, were controlled by religion as a belief system and as a social organization, and by the alliance of church and state, were gradually shifted over to psychiatry. 
Here again, I will only mention one example of this. What is, what is still in theory, now it's only in theory, but what was one of the greatest sins in the Jewish and Christian religions? Suicide. Now, suicide was also, during the days when church and state were allied, severely punished. Now, you may wonder, how can you punish suicide? Well, very well. That's a long story. I won't get into that. But one of the punishments, of course, was that the, the corpse was not buried in consecrated ground. Also, the estate of the dead person was confiscated and so on. It's a complicated story. So, that became the primary ground for mental hospitalization, payback in the 18th century. If you committed suicide, that meant you were out of your mind. Again, it's a long story. The, the whole idea of the insanity defense was first introduced posthumously for people who committed suicide. Only later was it used for people who were still alive and killed somebody or tried to kill somebody, a king or the prime minister. So this is how it developed. And of course, today, virtually all of the sins are mental illnesses or treated as if they were mental illnesses. Uh, if you eat too much, that used to be called gluttony. Now it's called uh, eating disorder and, and so on. You can go down the list. Now, since this is so obvious to me and has been obvious to me long before I went to medical school, I will mention. Uh, what has been the libertarian response to this? Uh, which has intrigued me for a very long time. Because what are the two cardinal libertarian principles? Well, if you can with the literature, you will always come up, just like in psychiatry, you come up with the phrase danger, mental ill, mental illness, of course, is one of these key terms and I'll come back to it's a kind of a, a key metaphor very similar to religious metaphors which you know you are, you are just supposed to mention you're not supposed to think what it means but if you mention that it's obviously something very bad and justifies all kinds of actions now what are the two libertarian principles self-ownership going back to Locke and all that and non-aggression you do not initiate aggression unless somebody, uh, except in self-defense. Now, on these two grounds, psychiatry is the most egregious of of offender against libertarianism. In a way, although these comparisons are inaccurate because a different kind of issues are involved, but in a way much more obvious than economic principles, now, economic regulations. The economic system obviously affects virtually everyone in society or everyone in society, but it affects them less directly than a policeman, perhaps with an ambulance showing up and putting you in handcuffs and taking you to a place called hospital, where you are then locked up forever. Now, the fact that they may let you out nowadays and give you drugs, we can talk about that. I'd be happy to have a discussion about that. The fact is that this is an arbitrary power which now potentially affects everyone. Now, the spread of this is also worth mentioning because these principles, principles like this don't stand still historically. They spread. Now, this principle of justified violence, which of course has tremendous parallels to political violence, I mean, what do what is a standard line with which psychiatrists justify that they lock up people? But they say we are trying to help the person. He is now mentally ill, he's out of his mind. After we have treated him, treated whatever that may mean, electric shock, lobotomy, drugs, whatever, Hinkley is still being treated. I'm wondering when he'll recover, just down the street. He's in the hospital, not in a prison. So this is not a theoretical issue. We are treating him, and after we have treated him, we will have restored him to liberty. Well, this is exactly what we now hear about uh, Iraq. 
we have liberated them. Well, does everybody there feel liberated? This is exactly what people say. They are liberating the patient from his psychosis. If you open any psychiatric textbooks, this is what you will hear. Now, this is one of those propositions which you either believe or you disbelieve. Because there's no intellectual content to it. Other than denying the confined person his capacity as a human agent. But this was also the rationalization for slavery. This was the rationalization for denying women rights, generally, the sub subjection of women. If you read John Stuart Mill's great book on the subjection of women, then he's speculating about this. How come women are still, in 1860, not treated as equal? Why, why can't they vote? Why can't they own property if they're married? You know, Women couldn't vote. When I was born in Hungary, women still couldn't vote in America. You know, how do people explain that? But they explained it the same as psychiatry explains it. We are taking care of them. We are shielding them from a burden. This is what you hear, shielding people from the burden of mental illness. Now, despite my critics, I am not callous about mental illness, which of course doesn't exist. But human suffering does exist which people nowadays call mental illness. Well, that's very real. And I think such people ought to be helped on their terms. Otherwise, help is not help. Otherwise, help is coercion. Now, this again is a matter of plain English. Now, you can say the person can't take care of himself yet. Well, that's what we say about our children. I think this kind of coercion is proper and inevitable in the family. You don't ask your two-year-old daughter or son whether or not you want a vaccine. Now, you try to talk them into it and be nice about it, but it's coercion. You are taking care of them until they can take care of themselves. But at what point, and this is a general sociological legal conundrum, at what point does society say you are now grown up you are now responsible for what you do, and you are free unless you break the law, assuming the law is not stupid law, or anti-libertarian, outright anti-libertarian law. Now, psychiatry has managed to annihilate this whole proposition, because everybody is potentially, all his life, or her life, and even posthumously, declarable mentally ill, and this then becomes a legal battle and a, a completely corrupt operation. I, I mean, if a person is very rich and wants to disinherit relatives, the chances are that that will can be broken if the person, if the uh, people who want to contest the will are smart enough and have enough money and hire good lawyers, the only question is how much they will get. It's very much like tobacco suits. So this is why I believe that this whole psychiatric ideology is completely inimical and, in, and irreconcilable with libertarian principle, with the whole principle of the free society. Now, where am I going with this proposition? To something which I have said 40 years ago, I think, for the first time, this is again, uh, one doesn't have to invent the wheel in dealing with this subject, because it's all very similar to what has happened historically before, with witchcraft, with the Inquisition, with slavery. These are all, the operation of all these systems of control depend upon an alliance of the system, the church, historically, with the state. So what's the answer? Separate church and state. Then the priest can do whatever they want, as long as they can't lock you up, as long as you can walk out, as long as you can say, well, thank you very much. I don't believe what you're telling me, but, you know, you're a nice man. Goodbye. I don't want you to save my soul. I don't want you to save my body. I don't want you to save my mental health. Goodbye. But the state is now psychiatry, much more so, in my opinion, than religion was America in 1776. NIMH, NIH is indistinguishable now from the American state, regardless of whether it's Republicans or Democrats. Healthcare, well, you already saw that during the Hillary debacle, is 
the real thing. Defense is really number two, because defense, I mean, they are already on the top of the world, you know, who, who is going to beat us? So that's, that's a secondary issue. Traditionally, that was number one. And traditionally, the number one way to deprive people of liberty was to make one cry, which Robert Hicks, in, a very, in his very fine book, has written a whole book about this. Just say two words, national emergency. Then you can do anything. Now all you have to say is psychiatric emergency. Who is going to stop you? Now, there's only one thing, obviously, that stops people now, because the one thing that now stops people in this kind of operation is social class. By and large, as, as, uh, as always, as all laws, ultimately, uh, the brunt of all laws, ultimately, is uh, rests much more heavily on poor people than on rich people, on stupid people than on intelligent people. So to some extent, if you are of sufficiently high class and are not too stupid about it, then you can protect yourself no matter how quotes crazy you are. And again, the daily press here entertains you about this day and night. This is an older example, but I'm citing it because it's the most dramatic one in my lifetime. And that was a story of Howard Hughes. Now, many of you here are probably too young to remember really that story, but Howard Hughes was this fabulously wealthy man, uh, good-looking man, squire, beautiful movie actresses when he was young, flew planes, and so on. And he didn't age very well. Anyway, he became quite crazy. Uh, he was so crazy, for example, that when somebody would call him in New York, he had all these lackeys with all this money who took care of him. Uh, he would insist, uh, uh, you know, have people spy on them, that they have a, a mask on them because he was going to get an infection through the telephone. But this was a sophisticated man, intellectually. He was not, you know, was the lack of knowledge of bacteriology. And uh, towards the end of his life, he lived in a hotel in Las Vegas. This is a true story, told in biographies of him. And by this time, he didn't bathe and he let his nails grow fabulously wrong, you know, God knows how many inches. And generally, it looked like a scarecrow. And uh, uh, the place, the rooms that he had began to smell, and the guests complained to the hotel management. You have to do something about this. Well, they didn't call psychiatrists, they didn't call the police. They talked to Mr. Hughes, who bought the hotel and threw out the guests. But by and large, this story is replayed. Now, there are exceptions to this. If this is within the family and the targeted person is a relatively helpless child. And the most awful example of this, again, is examples right next door. Some of these family members are still very much alive. But the sister of Senator Kennedy, as far as I know, is very much alive. Rosemary Kennedy with a lobotomy. According to the historians, not even his mo her mother knew about it. Arranged entirely by old man Joseph Kennedy. Why? Because she slept with taxi drivers and other low life while he was ambassador, US ambassador in, in London, to the court of St. James. So here comes the another operative word, which you must keep in mind. Embarrassment. Why do people get locked up? Because they embarrass other people, especially in the family. But it can also be on the job in society. You know, you go walking around naked in the street. You know, you're not supposed to do it. It's an embarrassment. It's a violation of the law. So, uh, I have hit the high spots, needless to say I could uh, talk a great deal more about this, but let me end by re-emphasizing the difference between the private practice of psychoanalysis and psychiatry. See, when I grew up in Budapest, psychoanalysis was, was already a kind of a popular thing. Uh, 
both it positively and negatively. Uh, it was discussed. Uh, I would say I already knew a good deal about it when I was a teenager. And the one thing that was perfectly clear then, which is perfectly unclear now to any psychiatric, any young psychiatrist, any psychiatric resident in Washington, if you ask him who Freud was, he will say a Viennese psychiatrist. That's one thing that Freud was not. Now you may think it's a matter of semantics. It's not a matter of semantics. A psychiatrist was a physician who was employed by the state and worked in a state mental hospital. That was a definition of it. Has it ever occurred to you why between, 18, between 1900, let's see, and 1920, in Austria, in Hungary, in Germany, even in Germany, it was certainly between those years. When nine out of ten, if not a ten out of ten, of the famous psychoanalysts were Jewish, there was not a single famous psychiatrist who was Jewish. For the same reason why there were no generals who were Jewish, or no prime ministers. That was a state job, highly valued, in part patronage, in part awarded for your knowledge. You as a professor, Kreppelin in Berlin, Breuler in, in Zurich, and so on. These were all non-Jews. Now, Freud never worked in a state mental hospital. He was not a psychiatrist. Number two, what characterized psychiatry? And here again, my, my early interest was no doubt helpful and my family's interest in economics. Look at it from a purely economic point of view. Psychoanalysis is, is was, again, this has all changed so that it's now totally muddied. Psychoanalysis was the paradigm of a private contract. It was exactly like contracting, which was Freud's own comparison, with a language teacher. It was quite common for children in well-to-do families especially in countries like Hungary, to have language, to have a private tutor come and teach you German, or French, or English. Now, this person came, parents paid them, whatever the going rate was, and he taught English. And when uh, either party wanted to quit for some reason, then they quit. Now, this was psychoanalysis. And this analogy is important. This was Freud's own analogy to the language teacher. Because by and large, all of Freud's patients were of a much higher social class than he was, and were much richer. Well, which wasn't hard because Ford was very poor. And this was paid from the consumer's pocket. And there was also confidentiality. Now, the one thing that characterized the state mental hospital was that there was no money transaction. The doctor was a state employee who got a salary. Now, on the site, he may have had some quotes private practice. But the state mental hospital patients were, like in, the, in those days, prisoners in a prison. That was part of the cost of operating the state and protecting it from these disturbing elements. Now, what could be more different than these two enterprises? Well, they have, they have coalesced. They have coalesced with the result that, two, that several new legal principles have come into operation. Now, these are semi-technical terms in psychiatry and law. One is called the duty to protect. Now, the duty to protect means that if anyone called a mental health professional, but typically a psychiatrist, has a patient who kills someone, doesn't matter whether he kills himself or someone else. While he's under treatment, the psychiatrist is liable to malpractice litigation, which he has virtually no chance of winning, because it's his duty to protect whether or not his patient was dangerous. Now, I actually have some clippings here, which I brought with me, where a person who was in the treatment, uh, went out and killed someone, ended up in prison, and sued the psychiatrist for not stopping him from killing. 
and, and won an award, a money award, for $300,000. As uh, Richard Weaver beautifully said, ideas have consequences. These ideas have consequences. So the duty to protect, and also the second principle, which you probably heard about in the newspaper, the right to treatment that came in even earlier. The right to treatment was introduced in the week, already in the 60s, as a, resource, as a societal psychiatric legal response to the complaint that there are all these hundreds of thousands of people languishing in state hospitals who are not getting treatment. Now, of course, they were not getting treatment because everybody knew that they were not sick. But there was a secret that was, you know, unspoken, that couldn't be spoken. Psychiatrists knew perfectly well that these patients were not sick. When they got sick, they called the doctor. And, uh, you know, professional scuttled but was that the worst place to get sick, I mean sick in a literal sense, is in a state mental hospital because nobody will believe you. So, these two, so the right to treatment, of course, now implies that you can violate people's uh, bodily integrity and mental integrity nowadays mostly by giving them involuntarily drugs, epitomized, exemplified by the so-called outpatient commitment. In the old days, if you were not in a mental hospital, you were free. You could flee the system. For example, you could uh, live in Chicago and, and go to New York if you wanted to escape the system. Now you can't escape the system. It's nationalized and you have a right to treatment. And you know, if you are ordered to have outpatient treatment and you don't show up, then they come after you. Essentially, you are in a lifetime, potentially lifetime parole. Now one more thought, and then I stop. Underlying this whole thinking is something which has become completely unacceptable to progressive thought. I don't mean progressive in the liberal, in the political sense. But what counts now as science, even in medicine and even in scientific journals. And that is my whole proposition depends upon the claim that there is a difference between what we call, what we used to call a disease, such as cancer or heart disease, or high blood pressure, or cirrhosis of the liver, or a bad cold. There's a difference between these things and phenomena that used to exemplify and still exemplify mental illness, namely hallucination and delusion or simply bad behavior, like eating too much or eating too little, anorexia, so. Now what is, what are hallucinations and delusions? You see again, it's a technical term you're not supposed to think about. A hallucination is, quotes, hearing voices. Well, what's hearing voices? That was supposed to do what was supposed to be the thing you did if you were religious. You were supposed to listen for God's voice. That's why I said 40 years ago again, that if you go to church, and talk to God, that's called prayer. But if you come out of church and you say God is talking to you, that's called schizophrenia and you get locked up. <laughs> this has got to be a one-way telephone conversation. <laughs> and what's a delusion? Saying that there are weapons of mass destruction or saying that there are no weapons of mass destruction? Do you see what? The delusion is simply an erroneous belief. Well, by that definition, most everybody has delusions all of the time. So again, it's the, the, the concept is such that it can be applied ad hoc to victims who then cannot defend themselves. Because how do you prove that you don't have a delusion? And you are denying it. How do you prove that you're not going to commit suicide? And you are denying that you are depressed. So it's a catch-22. But again, let me emphasize, I am not talking about voluntary contracts. That's why separating psychiatry and the state is the simple solution. Because that means exactly like with religion, anybody who wants to practice what is called psychotherapy, and what that is, is not for today, 
Anybody who wants to practice that and wants to pay for it, that's a voluntary contract. No different than giving money to a church or to anybody else or to Telstar program or whatever. Coercion is a crime, period. Thank you. much, Tom. Let me just note to the people in the back that we do have a few seats down here in the front on the aisles, or on the, on the, uh, away from the aisle, if you'd like to come down and take them. Um, would you like to stand there? Yes, I think yes. Yeah, right, I'm, I'm I'll let you call on questions. Uh, so we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I'll ask Tom to call on people. Please, please don't please, hesitate. Yeah, go ahead. Please wait until the microphone gets there so we can pick it up on the tape. Please don't hesitate to ask questions because often the best clarification can be made in dialogue. Please. Uh, Chris Grieb, um, how do you have a solution or do you have any thoughts about the problem of people who have been confined to mental health hospitals who are now on the streets and who are behaving the best phrase I'll use is badly and I don't want to I don't want to give any examples because it isn't fit for mixed company. Um, it isn't fit really for public discussion, but I know of some horror stories. You see people sleeping yes. on the street and all sorts of things. And, and, you know, Law and Order did an episode where a guy got killed because he was just behaving terribly and this sort of thing. Do you have any solution? Do you, do you, do, you, is there, is there a quick solution or is, is it just something we have to deal with? The, uh, thank you very much. That's, uh, it's going to be hard to improve on that question. That's the most difficult question. And of course there is a solution which is not ideal and perhaps not ideally libertarian, although I'm going to come as close to it as I know how. Again, it's somewhat analogous to what do you do with the liberated slaves. And actually, in my book, I highly recommend, if I may be huckstering my book, uh, Liberation by Oppression, I have a whole chapter on something analogous, which has happened in this country, which was handled totally differently. Now, again, it's very helpful, really, at least uh, I always found it very helpful, obviously, largely because I'm very interested in it, namely to know medicine. Now, there is a very scary disease. Actually, it's not a scary disease, but people were very scared of it traditionally. Now, nobody even thinks of it. For which people were locked up for life in America, many other places, in America for the longest, and Japan, in Europe, this was stopped much, much earlier. Lepers. Those of you are familiar with Louisiana, there was a... a Leprosarium, a leper colony in Carville, Louisiana. So happens it's named after the ancestors of James Carville, uh, of, of current fame or notoriety, who comes from a very distinguished and apparently rich family whose, whose land, uh, uh, I guess, was donated to, the, to this. Now, there were people who shipped to the, were shipped to this place uh, all from all over the country. There was also one in... Uh, Hawaii, of course, very famous in, the, um, what's the name of that island? Uh, Molokai, thank you. Molokai, yeah, that if you visit Hawaii, people point it out. It now has a nice resort on it. It's extremely interesting. The history of leprosy, of course, as you know, is fantastically going back to the Bible, the, the unclean people. So there were people who were confined there. Sometimes they were sent there when they were children, five or six or ten or you know, newlyweds, 20, whatever. And that's where they were. And that became, of course, a community. It had a church, it had uh, chaplains, a newspaper, and so on. It, it was a little village. Uh, it's very close to Baton Rouge. Uh, I went there as, the first time I was in Louisiana. I was very curious to see it. Uh, the person I was with was not very, not very happy to go with me. <laughs> uh, now, when was this? In the 70s, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the date, but around 1970 or so, uh, this whole business was phased out. 
because it, it became known right after, during and after the Second World War that uh, one of the uh, magic bullets uh, which w- was uh, developed in Hitler's Germany and which is now uh, hardly used except for leprosy and some other drugs and glauco- and uh, not glaucoma, uh, uh, the infectious disease of the eye. Uh, the sulfur drugs, sulfonamide drugs, in effect cure leprosy or make it completely uninfectious and quiescent. So once a sulfur drug treatment of leprosy came into being, which of course the patients accepted because it's, uh, first of all, it's harmless, it's not unpleasant and so on, it's an antibiotic. Uh, these leper colonies were phased out all over the world and they were phased out here. Now, what happened? There were meetings held between the operators, it was operated by the National Institute of Health, right, or Public Health Service then, it was before the National Institute of Health. These people were given three choices, as I recall. The number one and most obvious choice was the same, essentially the same as happened after slavery. You can stay where you are, where you have lived all your life, but you will not be deprived of any liberty. The minute you don't like it, you can leave. Nothing will be done to you against your will. But you can stay here. Room and board, and some kind of a stipend, which they all got. Virtu- a very large proportion of the people chose that. For some old people, the choice was given to move to Baton Rouge to a nursing home. The numbers are fairly small on, the, on this group. There was a third group who was given essentially medical disability, whatever it was, you know, same as you get for any other medical disability, I think more, whatever, maybe some free housing, government housing, and you could go wherever you want. You are now an American, not a leper anymore. And people made these choices. End of story. Now, there is one more wrinkle here that you have to bring in with the mental patients. Madness, mental illness, is called madness for good reason. Some of these people are mad, angry, and violent. Punish them like anybody else. There is no other way. And I don't see why not. First of all, many of them, now I'm getting psychological, many of people, like many of these people and many other people, commit crimes, minor crimes, to get room and board. See, they live in a society, and I like to make these jokes when I talk to students. There's one thing which you cannot do in America. You cannot walk up to either a prison or a mental hospital and say, look, I am bored with life. I don't know what to do with themselves. I don't want to work. I just want room and board and be left alone. Can you let me in? This is what we have to have. It will be much cheaper than now. Room and board and being left alone, traditionally, for whatever number of years. But during this time, complete law-abiding behavior. Now, I'm sure that it would cost a fraction of what it now costs to run these snake pits on Long Island and elsewhere that the New York Times discovers every couple of years discovers how terrible these so-called institutions are, which of course are no longer called mental or hospital. So the, way this, the way the mental health movement has worked is to change the name every 20 or 50 years. Madhouses, insane asylums, pauper asylums, uh, psychiatric institutions, forensic institutions, now, now they are homes, uh, transitional living, whatever. You know, language is uh, flexible. So you change the language, don't change anything else. So that will be my solution. But first of all, give people essentially, which I actually suggested many years ago, let them stay in the state hospital. Let them stay in Creedmoor. Just fire the psychiatrists and social workers. And put in policemen who will only arrest people if they break the law, like, a, like in any other housing project. That's a housing project. So it's very simple. But you see, you have to treat them as existential equals. Psychiatry cannot afford to do that. 
any more than at some point the South could afford to say, yes, black people are exactly like white people, there's no difference. Somehow, that took a long time to say that. That took a hundred years. Think of it. Yes. Yes, sir. I have a statement to make about a suicidal concept in Islam. In Islam, it's very strongly forbidden. So all these international terrorists who blow themselves up must go to hell if there is any hell. And my question is about the person who acted on the delusion that Iraq had weapon of mass, mass destruction. Should, shouldn't he be treated by Uncle Sam? I assume that was a joke. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Alex Crockney Powell. I'm from the National Youth Rights Association. And I was very encouraged by the comparisons you made between um, the denial of um, humanity, I suppose, of women and slaves and mental patients that, you know, things need to be done for their own good to protect them and all that. And I'm just wondering what parallels you draw from that same um, situation with the treatment of teenagers in society that are, for the exact same reason, things are done to them coercively for their own good, Uh, teenagers, young people, students, um, that are taken to, you know, prescribed on Ritalin or taken to um, behavior modification camps or just simple laws like you know, the voting age or drinking age that deny them their own uh, personhood, I suppose. Well, uh, not surprisingly, these are very good questions, uh, given the value of this uh, uh, talk. I really feel, and I'm not being falsely modest when I say this, that I have nothing special to say about that. Because that really is a broadly cultural, sociological, political question that has that people have discussed for hundreds of years. And that is that given the fact that society, all societies that we know of, virtually all societies, certainly all modern societies, if you are not going back to some aboriginal tribe, which is not interesting, all modern societies are biphasic. They are becoming triphasic in the sense that there is an initial period, and uh, Mill discusses this, and Stephen, uh, his famous critic, discusses this also. The first phase is childhood, a period of indoctrination or learning or torture or whatever, depending on how good your wardens are. Childhood is a period of imprisonment. Your mother and your father are your wardens. The question is, are they good wardens or are they bad wardens? Now, if they are bad wardens, then they can ruin your whole life, if they are bad enough. If they are good enough, then they probably, then you probably get enabled by that and whatever other input to grow up. Now, at what point the law declares you to be a grown-up is up to the law. Now, we know that the law is both compassionate, intelligent, that's going to be three, not both, and stupid about it. I say all of this because I think it's fairly intelligent to let, especially in a country like this with suburban sprawl, to let someone 16 or maybe even 14 who passes some tests to drive with parental permission during daylight hours. Or at 16. Okay. Now you see, it's important that these lines be carefully thought about because with liberty goes responsibility. And you cannot give liberty to someone who, who we are then not prepared to hold responsible. So at some point, you have, this becomes absurd. You can't say this about a six year old. No, but where this line is set actually is very interesting. Again, history is our teacher. Think of Romeo and Juliet. What was that about? They were 13. What's a bar mitzvah about? What are the Jewish rituals? Those were the marks in society that society marked out for this 
crucial transition from childhood to adulthood. Now, he was then 13. Well, in simpler societies, well, we now see pictures of 80-year-old carrying rifles in Africa. So they're old enough for that. Obviously, they're not shooting their superiors all the time. Children are not stupid. You know that. You were children and you have children. <laughs> so this is, so I, you know, I would draw it, I would certainly draw it much, much lower than it is drawn now. And of course, this is also connected now to the whole business of compulsory schooling. You see, if schooling were separated from the state, then you wouldn't have this problem either. Because now the children are sentenced to sit in school. Another prison. So this is libertarian. This has a good, it's a good idea. It's going to be very difficult to implement. <laughs> Certainly, I am not waiting for it in my lifetime. But, <laughs> but this is a general idea. I mean, answer the question yourself. I mean, I have, I have no wisdom about this. But it's rather interesting that you can, you know, you can at some, uh, now you can be drafted, but you can't drink. Well, that's a stupidity. I mean, what, what is this? I mean, what are you trying to do? But you see another characteristic of this uh, common element between slaves, uh, women, mental patients, and so on, uh, is that uh, period of tutelage never ends. Because the tutelary authority always says not yet. Now, I wonder what will happen in Iraq, because we are into that game now, not yet. Chirac says yes, in one month, and Bush says no, not yet. Well, let them debate it. You know, that if, if somebody believes we've never gone in there, then we don't have that problem. Once you're in there, you have that problem. Now, again, history tells us how, how to handle this. Well, the British got out of India after a while, and all the European powers got out of the out of Africa. And you know, were they ready for freedom in Africa? Were they better off as colonies, some of these areas? These are ethical and philosophical questions. The fact is that colonialism and psychiatric coercion and slavery are in principle wrong. It doesn't matter whether it benefits some particular people. See, I was going to discuss that, that actually the psychiatric argument is, but look, there are so many people who benefit from psychiatric treatment and afterwards say they have benefited. See, that doesn't matter. I'm not arguing that my system is a better system of treatment. I'm arguing on another level. I'm arguing that it's an illegitimate method in medicine. It's also contaminating medicine, needless to say, this whole ideology. Yes, there were several hands up there. Yes, sir. Uh, Will I'm a true to Catholic University Law School. Uh, I have two questions, but I'll ask only one if that, that's the ground rules. I defer to the moderator. Just one? Yes, one. Please. Okay. Uh, uh, do you think it could be said that there is a libertarian wing within the psychiatric profession? I'm thinking of people like Peter Bregan, who are strong opponents of, of drug therapy. I'm thinking of those who were critical of the former Soviet Union for what they called abuses of psychiatry. I'm thinking of uh, the removal of, uh, of uh, homosexuality from the, uh, the, ma the, now I'm blanking on the name of the man, uh, what is it, diagnostic manual? Right. I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, could, could you comment on that? Well, I have commented on this in some depth, not at great length, because the question is good and its answer is simple. I consider all of these measures inimical to the libertarian point of view because they are what I called prettifying the plantation. We'll give the slaves more calories. We'll let them stay with their wives. We'll make it nicer. I don't want to name names, none of these people. And look, they removed homosexuality, but they put in 20 others. They put in smoking. And caffeineism, drinking too much coffee. And last but not least, they put in something for which two million people are now in prison. It's a disease, they say, called substance abuse. You use a drug that the government prohibits, even if you don't use it, if it's in your pocket. 
You never have to smoke marijuana and you are a drug offender and you are sick, according to the APA. So no, abolition is an either or proposition. And none of these people is for abolition. Not one whom you named. They all want to play better doctor. I know it's better for you not to take drugs. Well, we know that, so what else is in it? So, next, so they come out with, with some other treatment next week. That's what they did with, look, psychiatry is a history of cures. Somebody has already cured schizophrenia. 50 years, more than 50 years ago, and got the Nobel Prize for it. So what more do you want? This is a scientific fraud on a par, excuse me, with some religious beliefs. This is simply not true. It is simply not true that God created the world in seven days and told you to rest on Friday or Saturday or Sunday. They can't only three be true. This is simply not, not possible. This is, this, these are wrong. So my answer is no, these are not libertarian propositions. These are, I am going to be nicer to you than other people. Yes, please. Uh, Dr. Sass, Jim Bovard. I wonder if you'd have any comments or observations on uh, President Bush's constant use of uh, good versus evil to justify all of his wars. Well, thank you, by the way. Glad to see you in the flesh. <laughs> uh, uh, it's the same thing. In effect, he is saying uh, in this uh, religious terminology now that, you know, we are human and you are not human. We either have to kill you or we have to fix you. Until you, until you, we have to make a constitution for you. But when I hear some of this stuff on the radio, I think, you know, where am I? I mean, the founding fathers didn't call in somebody else from abroad to write a constitution. I mean, what does the word constitution mean? See, Orwell was right, but, in a, but not in the way in which he predicted. It was, the scenario didn't come out that way at all. In part, the perpetual war that he predicted, I see as a perpetual war of governments against their own people on the grounds of mental health and health. Essentially, a therapeutic state, not against each other. So that's just a variation on that, of course. It's, uh, if you are not with us, you are against us. But this is one of the things which set so many otherwise sympathetic governments, I think, against the Bush government, that, that there is this peculiar arrogance, which is very similar to psychiatric arrogance. It's not necessarily that everything he says is wrong, but uh, the way it comes out, it's off-putting uh, because of this polarization. Uh, yes. Uh, Tom Palmer from the Cato Institute. And before I ask a question that's a challenge, I'd like to thank you for your heroic devotion to liberty thank and what you. an inspiration you are to so many people. Thank you. I, I, I have tried. Well, now I want to challenge you, though, uh, on a, uh, one of the theses you've maintained, and perhaps I've misunderstood it. That has to do with the relationship between chemistry, behavior, and responsibility. If you agree that there can be chemical foundations for certain kinds of behavior. If you take alcohol, you may become more aggressive. If you don't take alcohol, you're less aggressive. And then obviously much more subtle forms of that. If one experiences behavior one would not want to experience and takes drugs, possibly even against what you say you want, and later are returned to what you claim is your true mind and thank the person who gave you the drugs have you been liberated in the experience i was once at a conference and i i witnessed someone absolutely go out of his mind over the period of about five days became stranger more fragmentary odd bits of conversation were coming out and then aggressive mildly physically aggressive to people obviously he'd gone nuts and we induced him to sign himself in, and his family came in, and friends. Later on, he was grateful. He said, thank you, I, I went crazy. Uh, we didn't know what he was going to do. And we really wrestled with this as a moral problem. 
he did voluntarily sign himself in. Uh, but afterwards, he was grateful, partly for the use of various drugs that calmed him down. Did we oppress him or did we liberate him? And what if he had not signed himself in voluntarily, but we felt he was a threat even to his own continued existence? Would we have been justified in using coercion to get him to take drugs that calmed him down? Uh, thank you. This is, uh, since I have been asked this many, many times, I am somewhat prepared. <laughs> uh, but this becomes potentially uncomfortable because uh, the actors have to be identified. See, who is a we? Who, is, who are the people who are using force or are threatening to use force, to use this language, and who is a person upon whom this message is exercised? What's the relationship between them? Now, without knowing this, it's not possible to engage this. Yeah. In this particular case, it was uh, two of his best friends uh, from his uh, academic department and his parents, and then others of us who didn't know him as well, but who had contacted those friends. So we didn't just call the police or just chuck him into a hospital. We did involve his family. And as I said, finally, he did sign a document. Having signed it, he was then put into a facility he could not leave for some specified period, 24 hours or 48 or something like that. So it was also somewhat uncomfortable uh, from the perspective of moral agency to con restrain himself in that way. But this, these were his intimate friends and family who were involved in, in this. It wasn't a group of strangers or some bureaucrat. Okay, thank you. Well, that's important. Well, I don't quite know where to get a hold of this thing, but let me try. First of all, it will take some time to answer this properly, because first of all, you see he signed himself in, and you see he went crazy. Now, from just from the fragments that you told me, I can see inconsistencies in that I doubt that he would have signed himself in if he had not known that, in fact, this whole language is incorrect. Because if a person under these circumstances doesn't sign himself in, then there is an apparatus to detain him involuntarily, which taints all psychiatric relations with anybody. This is a policy issue here. Please do what I suggest. And if you don't do what I suggest, then they'll make you do what I suggest. So in what sense is that voluntary? Now, secondly, if let, let go, letting go of that problem. If that kind of duress sufficed for him to sign himself in, why couldn't he each step of the way sign a consent and be treated as if he was a consenting adult? Now, what you are bringing out that no policy is without a cost. It is quite possible that some people under a libertarian policy would commit suicide. I wrote a whole book on this called Fatal Freedom who may not commit suicide now. But it is my prediction that much fewer would commit suicide because if you read enough of this subject, you read that many people kill themselves because they don't want to be taken to a hospital. And you know that they will be if they are depressed again. See, for every one of these scenarios, I can cite you a dozen from the public domain where people were treated wonderfully by psychiatrists and as soon as they could kill themselves. Ernest Hemingway, This goes on. So, now the numbers, uh, but the bigger problem is this. What about the people who accept this kind of a person? See, I, since I've, I was never a psychiatrist, by the way, in ordinary terms, because I never coerced anybody. How I managed to do that, that was partly because that was in such an early days of psychiatry. Because I can't put myself in the position of the psychiatrist on the other end, on the, on the receiving end. I mean, here is this person who says, Dr. Sass, please leave me alone, I want to leave. 
I can't leave my cell. I can't go home and say, no, you can't. I'm going to give you electric shock first for a drug. A drug which may alter your brain forever. I mean, do you want to take Haldol? How many people want to take Haldol? Voluntarily. Someone just mentioned the psychiatrist to say that these are bad, bad drugs. Of course they are bad drugs. All drugs are bad drugs. All drugs are dangerous unless you need them, specifically. But as far as the chemical causes for, for behavior, let me give you the most obvious ones. Two obvious ones to show you how differently they are treated. Puberty and postpartum depression. Now, we go through life, even when we are healthy, not to mention if we have diabetes, in, we go through life in such a way that at various points, our behavior, our brain is very much under the influence of chemicals that we, we are not used to or are strange to us, of which puberty is the best example. Well, why doesn't every red-blooded 16-year-old boy who is really full of hormones rape every girl that he sees? That's how he feels like. It's called self-control. What happened to self-control? If, if you talk to this person nicely and calmly and point out how he behaves, and if he behaves this way, he will be fired and so on. He will be punished informally in the same way as if he was doing it voluntarily. Then maybe he would change his behavior. Maybe he would say, no, there's something wrong with me. Take me to a doctor. See, I said at the very beginning, I have no objection, any objection to any voluntary interaction. But the clinching point is, how does a psychiatrist know which patient ought to be treated involuntarily? What are his tests? Is there a chemical test for any mental illness? Is there a test for any so-called mental illness? There never was and there never will be. Because as soon as there is one, it becomes a brain disease. So we are going around and around. I'm glad you asked that question. There is a brain disease which causes huge behavioral changes, which used to be treated as madness, used to be treated differently by the law than other people, called epilepsy. Now, as soon as epilepsy became effectively treatable, essentially in the 1940s, I was already in medical school, the laws changed. Now, if you have epilepsy and you do something under an epileptic fugue, it's your responsibility because you ought to be taking the drugs that stop it. In Roman law, actually, there's nothing new under the sun. In Roman law, if you committed a crime where there's the influence of the alcohol, the penalty was heavier, usually double of what it would be otherwise, because you knew that alcohol is an intoxicant which tends to release inhibitions. Therefore, you are responsible for having intoxicated yourself. And that is my idea of responsibility. And the same thing goes for, quotes mental illness. Once a mentally ill person has been told, look, you are crazy, you tend to behave this way, then he cannot say, I don't know this anymore, or it's not true. He has been told. It's like being told, look, this is a one-way street. I'm giving you a warning, a traffic warning. Don't drive down this way again. That's it. If he does it again, he's guilty. Yes. Hello, my name is Meredith. Um, what if you crossed into a psychotic state and you're hallucinating so heavily you can't be responsible? You said with freedom comes responsibility. Or uh, Are you against treating with drugs? To well, may I, may I And ask? if it's don't, all don't, sit, don't, sit, don't, sit, don't sit down. Could you rephrase your question? in such a way that you use only English words and no psychiatric words. What if you cross from a rational state, no, into no, okay, okay, okay. A, a state where you're hallucinating so heavily? No, 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 no that you can't say. Uh, where uh, isn't, the pope, isn't the Pope supposed to hallucinate? Isn't he supposed to hear God's word? Where your thoughts no. become so overwhelming that you can't collect your senses and act rationally? Are you against a, a drug that would stop the hallucinations? But this, uh, is, uh, uh, this is circular. Particularly I mean, if the person asks for it voluntarily. Asks but I already answered it. Oh. 
If the person asks for something, then it's no different than asking for an antibiotic for, or an aspirin. Then if you want to, you help him. The issue is at what point do you use coercion? And also you don't name who. You see, you can't, let's assume this is your husband or your daughter. You can't use coercion unless the law authorizes you. You see, people talk about mental illnesses like any other illness. But the fact is that in every country, in this country, let's talk about this country, there is a set of, there are two sets of laws. One set is called criminal law. Another set is called mental health law. Well, if there was no mental health law, you wouldn't have this problem. You would have a, an existential problem of how to relate to this person with whom you are in complete disagreement. Because what they say is happening, hearing voices, you say is not happening. So you have a disagreement. And we always come down to that. Embarrassment and disagreement. And who, who can use power in this situation? There's one solution which I didn't mention to all mental illness. And if this hasn't alienated, if I haven't alienated you already, now I will. It's called divorce. Leave the person. If somebody behaves in such a way that you can't tolerate it, then you don't have to interact with them. No, not nothing compels you to interact with that person. That's why this typically arises between adolescent or young adult children and their parents. That's a typical scenario. And the child misbehaves. And the parent is embarrassed, chagrined, upset, compassionate, you name it, but doesn't know what to do because cannot use the criminal law. The person hasn't committed a crime. The person is simply staying up at night, smoking marijuana maybe, or not smoking marijuana, but playing the TV at 3 o'clock in the morning and not bathing and is not going to work. And he's sitting in your living, in your bedroom. You are supporting him. But this is a hell of a heck of a problem. I'm not minimizing you. I am saying that psychiatry should not solve these problems by coercion. It's very co Obviously, if psychiatry was not, not so convenient, we wouldn't have it. So all of these questions bring out the social utility of psychiatry. Yeah. Of course. Let's take one last question here and then adjourn upstairs. Me. <laughs> <laughs> you win. You, Thank you. You've created a bad incentive system. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Diane Levy. So, if I go out on the tennis court and I play hard tennis, my body gets strained. And if I continue to play hard tennis, I might break something. So, when you stress your body, it breaks. Now, when you're in a mental, if, if you're um, stressed in your mind, if you're stressed mentally, if the child is abused and can't fight back, if you're in the army and you're getting a lot of instructions and you can't come back, are you saying that the mind doesn't go to a place where it hears voices or hears hallucinations under stress? What I'm saying is much worse. And let me take a few minutes on this. What I'm saying is that there is no such thing as a mind. Think about that. I mean, I'll be straight with you. I don't believe that there is such a thing as a mind, such a thing as ghosts, unicorns, gods, any number of other abstractions that most people, millions of people, billions of people believe in. There is no mind. There are only persons. Now, it might interest you to know that the word mind as a noun didn't even exist in the English language before the 17th century. Now what was it? The word mind existed, it was a verb. Who is minding the store? Minding is attending to the outer world, including other people, including our own thoughts. And what all of these questions revolve around is self-reflection. Hallucination is self-conversation. The term already the ancient Romans used. People speak to themselves. When they disown their own voices, then they're said to hallucinate. Neurologists have studied this, and the hallucinating person's brain area is activated where the speech center is, not where the hearing center is. If you put instruments on his throat, there are contractions of his 
Muslims associated with speaking. This has been demonstrated decades ago. Hallucination is speaking to yourself. Well, who else's voice could you hear? On a more humorous note. You know the typical thing you read in the paper, somebody wipes out his family, maybe it's postpartum psychosis, which certainly is a big hormonal event, but it's got nothing to do with it, and kills two or three or five children. This happened a few months, as you know, in Texas. Now, this woman didn't claim that. The typical claim is that God told me to kill my children because we are just bringing them into hell or some, some religious, essentially religious story, by the way, the religious coloration of many of these psychiatric hallucinations really now eludes most people and the psychiatrists never mention them. They always have a religious coloration. They, they never say an atheist told me such and such. Nobody has ever hallucinated that. An atheist told me such and such. I heard that voice. <coughs> it's always God. Now, the note on which I want to end is how come God, how come people who are psychotic never, never hear God telling them, now get up this morning and be especially nice to your husband and children. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. We're delighted to have you here. We're delighted to have you as an adjunct scholar. Thank you very much. Um, I invite you to continue the question session upstairs in the Winter Garden um, over intoxicants, which in this jurisdiction are divided according to age. Um, <laughs> but help yourself upstairs. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Oh, wow. Look at you're going to get a hug from everybody.